My name is Richard Mueller. Uh, my wife is here with me, Claire. Give him a wave. I got in trouble last time because I didn't introduce Claire. <laughs> anyway, we were both in the Foreign Service for 32 years, had a wonderful, wonderful career. Uh, I recommend it to anybody who's interested in the world uh, and really wants to get around the world. Uh, we met in Henry Kissinger's office. If you want to hear anecdotes about Henry Kissinger, see Claire later on. She's really good at Henry Kissinger anecdotes. Anyway, but the important thing is that we're here to welcome two really great friends of ours. It goes back to 1980, but who have been wonderfully successful in both their business uh, endeavors as well as their, uh, you know, Richard and his Foreign Service uh, work. I first met Richard in 1980 in the Dongfang Hotel in Guangzhou, China. A few of you may know it. Uh, we had, you know, he was a young Foreign Service officer. We were eating dumplings and he said, I don't know what my next assignment is. And here I was, you know, about 12 years older, you know, the older guy in the relationship. I said, well, come and work with us in the Office of East-West Trade, which in the State Department was managing and working on a lot of the new trade relationships with uh, China in 1980. So we worked together and then we went on together and worked together in the Office of Chinese Affairs. And the rest of uh, Richard's career you can read here. He went to the very top of the Foreign Service, career ambassador that very, very few people get to. He worked as press spokesman for quite a number of secretaries of state. Uh, he, he was American Consul General in Hong Kong. He followed me as Consul General. Anyway, please read about him. A very distinguished career. Lots and lots of ideas about the world and where we are and where we're going. But just as importantly, Carolyn, whom he married in 1982, and we have known since then, uh, has had her own incredible career in business, in trade, uh, getting GM started, General Motors started in uh, China many, many years ago, uh, working for Procter & Gamble both in China as well as in Washington. She can tell you about the inside the Beltway stories in, in Washington. She worked for Project Orbis in Hong Kong. So she has had her own, and now she's chair of the board of Population Services International, which is a nonprofit that helps families, uh, women, girls, literally around the world. So here we have two people who just have made a difference in the world. And I won't go on and on, but they're the sort of people you want to get to know who know about the world, have worked very, very hard to make the world a better place. So I'm delighted they accepted our invitation. We're going to do this as a bit of a tag team. Uh, she said, he said, and um, uh, tell my story, his story, uh, and move back and forth. Hopefully it won't be too confusing. We won't lose the thread. But then what we hope to do is the wrap up and really have a conversation with all of you uh, and answer your questions. Uh, and hear what you have to think about what's going on in China and the world. So, I'll start. Um, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Claire. Uh, we are delighted to be here, and it gives us a great excuse to see the Mueller's after four years. We haven't seen you in person, so it's, it's wonderful to be back in uh, the mountain state of Colorado. Um, so as Richard explained um, a little bit about our backgrounds, my background, you know, 40 years working in, at the intersection of business, public policy, and government relations. Uh, I've worked for two Fortune 100 companies, General Motors and Procter and & Gamble, um, a along with roles at a couple of business associations, uh, U.S.-China Business Council, and the Business Roundtable, which is a CEO lobbying group in Washington. I made a brief pivot into the nonprofit world with Orbis in Hong Kong, which is a wonderful experience and uh, um, has really touched a lot of lives in the uh, emerging markets around the world. I retired from uh, Proctor in 2017 
and moved on to consulting and some teaching and serving on nonprofit boards. So my focus through my entire career has been uh, helping companies grow markets in the US and globally, building relations with foreign governments and consumers, and advocating for sound regulatory and trade policy. Um, I worked on issues spanning the globe for GM and Procter, but had a special focus on Asia uh, and emerging markets for both companies. Um, my fascination with Asia came early. I was a 16-year-old exchange student in Mumbai, India uh, in 1972, and uh, it changed the world for me. And I came away thinking, I want to serve in some capacity where I can work and help bridge cultures and learn foreign languages, and then went on to study Mandarin. So um, it, my career experiences uh, firmly shaped the, me as a globalist, which is somewhat of a dirty word, I think, in some parts of our country, unfortunately, today, um, but with a strong belief that there's a real power in open markets and freer flow of goods, services, and ideas across geographical borders. Um, I, a real belief that markets create jobs, grow economies, and raise the standard of living for people everywhere. Um, we saw it in China, in India, Vietnam, Brazil, Myanmar, as well as Ohio and West Virginia, among other places. Over to Richard. Okay, it's my turn. So, uh, I'm the other Richard. Uh, I had the pleasure of working for Richard Mueller twice in my career. Uh, he found me in Guangzhou, confused young man who eventually found out what he wanted to do in the Foreign Service. Uh, I worked for Claire once when I was the Consul General in Hong Kong and she was my assistant uh, and would tell me what to do. So that was a good experience too and I'm happy to see both of them as often as I can. Uh, I also, you know, careers take a funny turn and at one point I got asked to be deputy spokesman for the Secretary of State at the State Department. And so I did that uh, under Secretary Baker for a while uh, and uh, uh, went on to other things, came back. Madeleine Albright called me up and said, would you come back for the last 10 months? My spokesman's leaving. And I said, sure. I miss the world is what it was. I've been off as ambassador to Cyprus and done a few other things, but there's something special about dealing with the whole world. And that's what I was able to do as spokesman. And when Secretary Powell came in, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I guess I'll stay for a while if you want me to. And he said, yeah, I want to stay for a while. So five years later, I was still there. Uh, and I went everywhere in the world with him and saw a few of you in strange places, right? Uh, and uh, anyway, so that's how things ended up. Um, when I left the Foreign Service, I went out and did global economics at Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, we were located in Paris, but I had to be there for my job. It was tough life. One of my Indonesian friends, I remember, we had some meeting in Bali, I think it was anti-corruption or something, and he said, you know, I said, God, it's really hard to get money to go to Bali. You know, you go to the personnel and the, the budget people and say, I got to go to Bali. And they say, yeah, right, fellow. And he said, well, it's just like me telling people I have to go to Paris. Um, so it works out in the end anyway. Um, after, you know, after OECD, I started teaching in the last nine or ten years. I've been teaching at Brown pretty regularly, occasionally at U Michigan, George Mason, and other places. Uh, just trying to teach the kids what I should have known before I'd done what I did. Um, but that's been a really great experience, too. So I'm happy to be here with you. We're both happy to be here with you together. And we'll see how this works. Uh, so, we met in China in 1980. It's a long time ago. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to go through a bit of history, see where it took us, and then talk about where we go from here. Right? right. Is that a good description? Um, if any of you are old enough, which probably only a couple of you are, uh, to remember 1980, it was a lot of turmoil going on. It was a very disconcerting time. Um, the world was uh, full of trouble, um, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Geostrategic tremors, you might say. We had just uh, 
opened up to China, but China was still moving out of the Cultural Revolution. Richard and Claire remember from there to her there, and even in 1980, there were still, you know, you'd go to factories and you'd see 1930s and 40s machinery, and you'd see these huge, you know, Cultural Revolution slogans still on the wall, Maoism slogans and all that kind of stuff. It was a very crucial time for China, but they were replacing ideological leadership with pragmatists. And they wanted what the U.S. could do, and they wanted what we could bring uh, to uh, uh, to their development program. Um, the United States itself was preoccupied in 1980 with our hostages in Tehran. Um, and that was a horrible transfixing event for all of us, I think, uh, until they got freed on the first day of uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency. Um, the Soviet Union had just invaded its neighbor. Ring any bells? Uh, and we were pumping material and training into the countries that neighbored Afghanistan um, to try to fight the Soviets, and they eventually won. Um, the U.S. had, you know, done the, the opening to Beijing. We moved our, our embassy to Beijing uh, in, uh, in 1980. And um, it was primarily an anti-Soviet move, but as we'll talk about, it opened up some possibilities. Uh, and the Europeans were trying to form a more perfect union. They were on their way towards a European Union from this motley collection of countries that had made vague pledges to each other. So there was a lot of change going on in the world. But remember, domestically, the doldrums had set in. Uh, we had stagflation. We had malaise, as President Carter said. Uh, and we had interest rates that were going up and up and up. And Anyway, it's a pretty tough time for a lot of people in America. Uh, but it was an interesting time, and it was a time of trouble. But I as we'll talk about, also a time of opportunity for a lot of us. Over to you. Okay. So um, I got my feet wet uh, as a young staffer at the U.S.-China Business Council in 1978. This is fresh out of Georgetown University. Uh, and months before, President Carter established full diplomatic relations uh, with Beijing. So my first trip to China was in actually the fall of 1979 for the trade fair, which was happened twice a year, and it was the portal for foreigners to come and uh, um, sell and buy with China. The Europeans had started attending the trade fair years earlier, but it was just the beginning wave of American companies that were um, participating. Um, it was, uh, my role there was to support council members, uh, member companies, big and small, who were coming to buy, you know, mostly things, commodities, feathers and down, spices, canned mushrooms, um, textiles, all sorts of um, um, low-end goods. And, um, and at the time, China's trade with the world was minuscule. So um, after the full recognition of Beijing happened in um, it was announced in December of 1978, 79. Um, we, in 1980, there was this tidal wave of interest um, from American companies wanting to have a piece of this huge one billion person market um, it, that was yet to emerge. The phones were ringing off the hook and the council staff itself was probably, I was the 12th or 13th person hired there and we expanded to like 40 in like almost overnight. Um, but we had Clairol calling to one and understand how to sell hair dye to China. Um, Wrigley Spearmint Gum, they wanted a piece of the action. Um, many companies, big and small, and uh, China used the council as a platform to host Chinese delegations to the United States. And this was the, the, the ones that were from the state-owned trading companies looking for markets. And uh, I escorted a number of them to places like J.C. Penney and Bloomingdale's, where the CEOs rolled out the red carpet and um, um, started establishing relationships, uh, or other delegations that were selling herbal medicines, bauxite, um, you name it. Um, lots and lots and lots of different kinds of products. So 
it was a really fascinating and interesting time. At the same time that China was working on um, building its import and export business, they signaled that they were interested in uh, foreign, exchange, foreign um, investment, first in some of the special economic zones, and then later in major cities and provinces. So successful American companies were getting good over the first four or five years at honing their skills in sort of understanding better this new and very challenging market, but also um, managing the ups and downs of the economic and political relationship, which became more and more important as the uh, years went on. Um, I joined then from the council, joined General Motors in 1984. Um, and uh, this was to open an office in Shanghai for its trading company. Uh, GM had visions of um, actually expanding internationally way beyond their initial markets in, in Europe and um, at Latin America and thought that uh, China was a good bet. Um, so um, our job really was to buy Chinese products to help generate hard currency, which the Chinese didn't have much of at the time. And so the GM could sell things like locomotives, which GM, believe it or not, sold in those days, pr produced in Illinois. Um, but also um, diesel engines and other products, in addition to eventually vehicles. Um, it was a, a fascinating and kind of crazy adventure. At that particular time, we were traveling through a lot of different parts of China, trying to find things to buy. Work gloves, twist drills, pigskin for um, leather that Cadillac wanted to use in their seat covers. Um, most of these were harebrained ideas. Many of them didn't work, but a few of them were successful. Um, but then in 1985, we got a phone call from Beijing that Zhao Ziyang had just been in the United States and had been you know, driving around in Cadillac limousines, and he liked them. He wanted to buy some. Uh, and we went then, set off, and negotiated the sale of 20 limousines for cash, um, actually, that were delivered and, um, in a grand ceremony. And one of my finest moments was having the limousines drive up under the Chair Chairman Mao's portrait in Tiananmen Square. Uh, with the limos lined up and uh, that photograph appearing in the New York Times the next morning. Uh, it was great. So, and how do we get that picture? Even better yet. So there were soldiers guarding Tiananmen, even at the, you know, um, day in and day out. And the PR firm was trying to get a shot without pe people in it. So we went to the guard and said, hey, we'll give you a ride uh, around the square in exchange for helping us clear the traffic. Uh, and they said, sure. <laughs> and we got some fantastic, fantastic shots. Um, so and, and, and the, the backdrop of this, a lot was going on in the auto industry in the United States, and as Richard was alluding to. Uh, but US companies were focused on Japan at the time. Uh, Japan, J uh, Japan was considered the big competitive threat, flooding the US with cars and electronics. Remember, uh, they bashed a Toshiba boombox on the steps of the Capitol? Um, it was, it was a, a time of, of heightened sensitivity about trade, but not trade with China yet. Um, so the US um, industry was um, you know, feeling the pressure. And so China appeared to be an opportunity in the future for the big three, particularly GM saw it this way. But they also were looking at other opportunities as well. US-Canada free trade agreement was negotiated at this time. That was the beginning of a real effort to integrate the auto supply chain between the US and Canada, and of course later uh, with the North American free trade agreement, um, a decade later included Mexico as well. Um, and GM was also working at the same time to establish Maquilador operations in, across the border in the towns in Mexico as a way to lower costs for auto components and parts, um, which was a, a successful way to compete with Japan. So in the midst of all this turmoil in the 70s and 80s, both the government and the, and the uh, business people found a lot of opportunities. Uh, and that 
pattern pretty much continued. So we're going to go quickly through history. I think both of us are firm believers that there's too much being said about the history of U.S. foreign relations, particularly with China, that's heavily distorted. So we kind of wanted to give you a more realistic picture of what was in it and how it worked. Um, it, it took nine years in the 80s uh, for uh, the Soviets to get out of Afghanistan, uh, for Gorbachev to come along and start changing things. And he was, as Margaret Thatcher said, somebody we could do business with. Um, Europe uh, sees the opportunity of, uh, you might say, American distraction and everything else going on in the world to uh, uh, unite and pretty much start coming together with a real plan for, for integration to become a, a European Union. Uh, after 1990, once the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact were gone, I'd say we had a decade or more of American hubris when we in the State Department and the government thought we could do anything and we could reshape the world according to our our own desires. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of things we got into in the world that were very, very good, helping people democratize and develop. Uh, but maybe we extended ourselves a little too far. That's one of the debates we still need to have in the United States. Uh, through this period, especially in the 90s and the 2000s, you have to remember all around the world, development was happening like crazy. And hundreds and hundreds of millions of people were getting out of poverty. And to the point where now they say abject poverty is hardly evident in the world anymore. There are plenty of people that are really, really poor. But there are fewer and fewer people that are starving. Uh, and we've now, I mean, this is sort of fast forward, but we're now in a world that is, it's half middle class, it's half urban, half of the world is educated into the secondary level, um, and for all the horrible things in the world, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people are living better lives, a lot of them in China, but all over the place. And so I think the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s were really a go -go, a good period for most people in the world. Um, and that, uh, that's something we ought to think about. We ought to learn from how and why that happened. And that's where I turn it over to Carolyn. So the 90s were indeed a, a, a point of huge growth, I think, for the American business community and companies going from being just doing international business to becoming true multinational corporations, um, true global enterprises. Um, Back in, in China, in uh, 1989, of course, there was the Tiananmen Square incident or massacre, um, depending on what you believe and, and read. Um, but it caused everybody to take a pause. West, Western companies were in a, I'm getting some feedback maybe, this, this is better. Um, Western companies were, took a pause. The US government placed sanctions on, um, on China. They were relatively, mild, um, if you think about what sanctions look like in this day and age. Uh, but they were on military, barring military sales to the Chinese, but also uh, barring um, educational exchanges um, uh, for a period of time. But then after two or three years, things started picking up again, and companies were really back to investing again and business as usual. At, in this period, Big business, and um, you know, including General Motors, which I was a lobbyist um, in the Washington office for this period. We argued that you know Western companies' presence in China is beneficial. It's actually it's helping to shape China's rise. It's helping to uh, educate on the rule of law, better governance, the best manufacturing practices and exposure to U.S. and European management um, styles was a good thing. Um, and these arguments we heard again a decade later when China was um, being debated in the U.S. Congress about its succession to the World Trade Organization. Um, and we know now that some of these things proved to be true, but many of them didn't. We made some uh, assumptions that were not correct. Um, so how are we doing time-wise? Okay. Um, after a few false starts, 
GM in the late 1990s won an opportunity over Ford to negotiate a joint venture in Shanghai uh, to produce Buick sedans. Uh, and, then, uh, and then Procter & Gamble at the same time was getting into China for the first time. It had been selling from Hong Kong and other parts of, um, of the world, but was able to establish a joint venture to produce laundry detergent, head and shoulders shampoo, and then a couple years later, Pampers diapers. That was the first product lines that were established there. It was through a joint venture with uh, Hong Kong billionaire uh, Lee Kashing. Um, that business grew so rapidly that P&G bought out Lee in 1999 and became uh, operated as a wholly owned company in China. So in this period, China became the world's manufacturing workshop and its consumer powers grew and grew and grew. Um, the economic reforms that were driven by Deng Xiaoping at that time laid the foundation for its entry into the World Trade Organization, uh, which was mostly being negotiated in the 1990s with World Trade Organization country members, um, the US being the most important. And so the US was the last to actually approve um, its accession and that congressional debate was um, I, a pivotal moment in US-China relations. Uh, and at the time, I was at the um, business roundtable as a business leader um, for, of the coalition that was helping to lobby on behalf of uh, China acceding to the WTO. Uh, it was a really interesting, interesting period for, for a lot of different reasons. The lobbying campaign was um, epic in the sense that it brought together a, a large number of strange bedfellows. Uh, it wasn't just big business and small business. It was religious organizations. It was some of the environmental groups, not all of them. Um, it was um, the Quakers. Um, and it was um, Catholic and, and Protestant churches throughout Asia, uh, all ho helping to build a message track which was, this will open up China and open up China to the world and, and help create an environment that will keep China following world norms and behaviors. Um, we, we did an enormous amount of work state by state in the United States, um, helping our uh, elected officials see the benefits of Colorado, for example, and the agricultural sales that could happen as a result of China's entry into the WTO. Um, and it was a, it, it would also help shape, believe it or not, the lobbying community and how the, the community lobbied trade agreements from that point forward for many, many other countries. Um, so it was successful. It, uh, in the, uh, the summer of 2000, it passed the House and then the Senate uh, with very strong um, margins, almost all the Republicans, and this was a time when Republican, the Republican Party was pro-trade, um, voted for it, and a number of Democrats. Uh, labor unions lobbied heavily against it, and so some of the um, more progressive uh, labor-supported um, Democrats voted no, but nonetheless, um, it passed in large numbers. Uh, and, uh, and, and we had a number of Democrats who, who had been on the fence for a long period of time, but really decided that it was the right move. So it was a really, as I said, fascinating, fascinating time in, uh, in US economic history. Um, and at, after China joined the WTO, we saw this huge explosion of um, consumer demand in China. Uh, and, uh, for example, GM's initial projections for the Buick plant was based only on what was then a restricted market in China for Chinese-owned uh, companies, um, corporations to own vehicles. But after the WTO accession, China allowed individuals to start purchasing their own vehicles for the first time. So the streets of China became crowded very quickly with motor vehicles. Um, and uh, And that was all due to um, you know, just amazingly swift changes in their uh, um, their regulations. Uh, but 
I would say, and we'll talk about this more in a second, on the WTO front, early signs of trouble, um, even in the first couple of years, uh, China was not living up to the commitments that it has made. Um, they had made significant concessions to open markets um, for an, in, an, in a wide number of areas, uh, banking, insurance, transportation, uh, telecommunications, but they dragged their feet um, and uh, on the actual implementation. And in some cases, it took 10 years or more or didn't happen at all. Um, and so um, US and foreign companies were feeling penalized. Um, they were they felt that China was getting the full advantage of access to the US market, but it wasn't happening the other way around. Uh, and, uh, and this went on and continues in the sense that subsidies, state-owned enterprise practices, they've never been fully addressed. Then finally, we saw the, the rise of Xi Jinping in uh, 2012, 2013, and China's um, efforts at economic reform came to somewhat of a, a standstill. And we saw progressively more restrictive and tighter controls on, on speech, on the internet, um, on private businesses in China. And of course, now we've, we've seen it in spades. Thank you. Oh, we're so, down so to one mic. We're going to use one mic so we don't get feedback. Okay. Um, so we're into the 2000s now, and I think for most of us, the 2000s began in September 11, 2001. Um, and it had very profound changes around our country, and even in our foreign affairs, not just because priority number one was stopping terrorism around the world, but we started to see the world as a fearsome, dangerous place. Um, and it was no longer a world of opportunity, it was a world of fear. And everything out there was coming to get us. And it was really profound. And I think, you know, for many of us, it was the first time, I guess, since Pearl Harbor that anybody had attacked us on U.S. soil and we felt suddenly vulnerable. And I think that infected not just the security policy, which was burgeoning, uh, but everything. We started thinking of the world of danger. And that really kind of infected everything that, that we do and things that I did at the time. I was spokesman at the time, so I was kind of out in the world a lot with Secretary Powell dealing with all the after effects and working on some of the cooperation agreements and things like that. Um, but remember, we also had worries about sort of domestic tranquility. It was the time when sort of insurgency politics was starting. Um, and we were um, taking leadership in the world to organize the international community to counter aggression, and we still do that, uh, but it was very security focused. And increasingly over the last 10, 20 years, security and military cooperation have grown exponentially, and I think we haven't done as much as we should have on the other facets of economic cooperation and uh, political cooperation in the world. Um, we abandoned the previous role that the United States had in making international economic rules. Uh, the WTO became a nasty organization that nobody wanted to talk about and nobody wanted to do anything with and we, we wouldn't appoint people and you know gradually we deteriorated our, uh, our participation there. And we got fearful of competition. You know, I thought when Americans meet competitors, whether it's in baseball or business, you know, we pull our socks up and get our ass in gear and go out and compete. Um, but we got fearful. Competition was dangerous. And especially with, with regards to China, everything that China did was somehow uh, you know, dangerous to us here in the United States. China was at this point feeling its oats. They were very proud of what they'd accomplished, bringing people out of poverty, developing companies, starting to develop their own technologies. Following the same path, frankly, that Japan did in the 60s and the 70s, that Taiwan did in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, and China was feeling their oats. They were feeling good. They were proud. They were sometimes arrogant as we went forward. Uh, but it wasn't unusual. It wasn't, uh, and it wasn't a direct threat to the United States in, in most ways that we can imagine. Um, 
And then we started hitting, you know, global crises one after another after another. But again, global development continued and more and more and more people started leaving, leading better and healthier lives. And that's something that was very good for all of us in the world. Um, I'm going to stop there because I can't read the other note that I wrote in late. Good. Okay. Um, so we, we got to a point in 2008, 2009 with a great economic crisis that um, certainly started in the United States and spread globally. And China, in some respects, in their rightful way, use that as an example of the flawed systems that we were following in the capitalist world. It weakened the United States' ability to make cases, um, particularly in trade negotiations, that somehow we knew a better way forward because we sure screwed it up. Um, but it, it had a, a, a long impact, I would say, on our ability to, to break through, particularly in, uh, in the continuing efforts to negotiate um, government to government on the, the commitments that were made under the WTO. Um, at, the, at the same time, companies continued to do, be very successful in China. Um, by 2009, um, China overtook the US to become the world's largest auto market. But many of those vehicles that were being produced were produced under um, foreign brands, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Buick, uh, Toyota, uh, Kia, uh, other, other uh, brands uh, from all around the world. And by well, 2022, China's now the second largest exporter of vehicles in the world, displacing Germany. So amazing progress in some of these sectors. In 2009, China became Procter & Gamble's second largest market in the world, uh, by, by sales, but also by profits. And uh, has now you know, more than a dozen plants, three innovation centers, and sales in every province. So the, the, where we are, where the 2010 to 22 period has led us, is that these global companies are heavily dependent on the China market. Um, and they, I mean, they benefited hugely from China and China as an engine of growth, both for the domestic market and for the world. Um, you know, shareholders have been rewarded. Uh, anybody who has money in stock um, has reaped benefits from China's rise. And millions of Chinese, as Richard said, have saw their standard of living improve. The growth of the middle class has been uh, uh, remarkable and the growth of the wealthy entrepreneurial class. So um, we're gonna fast forward a little bit to where we are today, and, uh, and which what we both believe we're in a really dangerous place between the US and China, and, and in terms of the political and economic relationship. Um, President Trump's approach and the President Biden's approaches to dealing with China are quite similar, actually. Um, I, let's just say that Trump administration had a little less nuance. Um, and the, um, the Biden administration believed more in working with our allies to um, um, bring them on board to support some of the US efforts. But where we end up today is these tariffs that have been put in place um, are hurting US consumers and contributing to inflation. And they're not particularly um, hampering Chinese exports to the United States. Um, I, you know, and I do think that President Biden should get some credit for working with US allies. And, but um, the administration we've seen so far has been pretty not, not so interested in hearing from the business community. Um, and that's not just with China, but the business community that's doing business globally. I would say in my past 30 years, we relied heavily on the US embassies around the world to help you know, open, um, create relationships, open markets, solve problems. And the Biden administration has basically said, American companies, if you're not doing business in the United States of America, we're not gonna, 
we don't have time for you. Um, and it's a disturbing place, I think, to be because uh, it somehow suggests that American company business overseas does not contribute to U.S. Um, e the economy at home. It's just, which is not true. Um, so where we are today is, I think we're seeing a big backlash in the United States towards globalization and free trade. Um, I blame that on the business community in large part and to some extent our own government for not talking more about it over the last three decades, but that the business community did not do a good job of anticipating economic losses that took place um, in conjunction with a lot of the free trade agreements that were in place. Uh, and, uh, and it didn't put a lot of effort on working with the government on better policies in place to, to train displaced workers to deal with communities that have been um, impacted negatively um, by, by the loss of manufacturing jobs. Um, and I don't think we've, even though we've, we have noted this, we haven't learned from it. We're not doing enough today to uh, counteract it. Um, so, I mean, bottom line is that the U.S.-China political and economic relations are at an all-time low. And there's very few off-ramps right now. Um, and the two governments are not talking together. And we have very few China experts in the United States, in the, any place in the administration that uh, have the kind of personal relationships with our counterparts um, that we were able to deepen, tap into in the um, 90s and 2000s. So um, it's, it's a bit of a crisis. But Finally, I always want to say the, the size and the wealth of the Chinese market cannot be ignored. And even despite all of this, U.S.-China um, um, trade accounts for one quarter of all global trade. And bilateral trade is at an all-time high, despite all of this. Um, so it is evidence that despite um, the, all the tensions, uh, decoupling is not happening and that uh, business and consumers are still needing and benefiting from these products and services that we're importing and exporting. And so what's next? What do we do? Uh, I guess, you know, my first thing is we've got to get back to thinking strategically and not just tactically and not just well, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? It's how are we going to build the kind of world we want to see and where the U.S. can continue to thrive. Um, I think we need to get back in the game of setting global rules and standards. We've abandoned this for the last six or seven or eight years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's time we got back in the, in the, in the game of putting, putting up a set of rules and alliances and groups that... Uh, that determine what kind of world China has to fit into. Um, and that means going back to the D World Trade Organization, the WTO has been much maligned, uh, and trying to set rules for things like the implicit subsidies in state-owned corporations, uh, what to do about corporations and exports that rip off somebody else's intellectual property, uh, how to govern data privacy, the United States is behind on well, except for California, the United States is behind on data privacy in sort of setting the rules for the world. Um, there are all kinds of issues like that. What, what about managing artificial intelligence? We all know there need to be rules and standards about artificial intelligence, but are we out there trying to create them? Are we out there working with allies and friends and partners to try to do that? Not that I can see. Let's put it that way. Um, we need to not just negotiate and set the rules, but we need to actually enforce them. I think all of us who've negotiated with China, who've been part of this exercise uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, uh, believe that our, our biggest failure was not in imagining what China could become, uh, but our biggest failure was not in enforcing the standards that we had negotiated with China. We all know, as Carolyn said, they've been pretty lax themselves about enforcement, and we really should have done a lot more to ensure rules were enforced, but you know there were a lot of reasons why some people benefited from lack, lack enforcement, not just in China, but elsewhere as well. Um, 
we show genuine leadership in the world, not just in military areas. Not everything is a security problem. And not, you know, not everything needs to be dealt with with a new task force or a military deployment or sending in the fleet. Um, and I think we tend to see problems that way first. In my view, that's part of the legacy of 9-11. But frankly, you know, stable economic growth uh, is a lot better for countries than having a bigger military. Uh, and that's something we have to work on a whole lot more and something we really can contribute to. Uh, the other thing I would say is our standing in the world and our influence in the world depends on what we do at home. Uh, there's a great line from George Kennan at the end of 19, uh, at the end of World War II, when he talked about the Soviet Union, and uh, he said that uh, how we demonstrate to the world that, that we're a country that knows what it's doing and is capable of leading uh, is going to determine how much we get to lead in the world, and I think that too is a big part of it. Countries around the world don't want to get stuck between the U.S. and China. This kind of tendency to say, well, it's us or them. It's not going to work. They want to take advantage of Chinese investment. They want to take advantage of Chinese markets. Uh, but they don't want to get stuck where China is their only partner, where they have to do everything that China says. Uh, and so they want us. They want us as a protector. They want us as a leader on international standards that they and China can be asked to follow. We're in a world now where China is sliding backwards in terms of its politics uh, under our new great leader, Xi Jinping. Um, it's been going in a backwards direction. Uh, and China's been pushy, have been throwing their weight around in the world. Uh, countries want to be with us. They want our help in dealing with that. Uh, and you can't tell them us or them. You can't tell them, you know, just say no. Uh, they want to take advantage of that, but we need to equip ourselves and other countries with the tools and the rules and the opportunities so that they can negotiate, so that they can resist, so that they can get what they want and have the courage to push back and sometimes push back really hard. Yeah. And we can get examples of that as we go into Q&A. So that's where I'm going to stop. Okay, we're over. Uh, we have the opportunity still. And uh, now we'd be glad to take your questions. Just real quick, who should hold China to the standard that they agreed to? Who would be the entity? Uh, Richard Mueller. <laughs> um, Richard Mueller and me uh, in our previous lives. Uh, the people in the, uh, in the State Department, the people in the embassies, uh, the people in the U.S. Trade Representative's office, um, that's where, if we're active in these organizations, if we're active in the World Trade Organization, if we're active working with our allies in Asia who have the same problems with China as we do, sometimes much bigger problems, um, we can all get together. We can get people together to deal with the Chinese pretty forthrightly and in a way that, that makes them adhere. But, you know, we win most of the cases that we take to the World Trade Organization. Uh, as maligned as the thing is. China loses most of the cases where they get hauled into court in the World Trade Organization. Consequences? Consequences, uh, very few, because there haven't been too many cases recently, because the United States has failed to appoint people for the last, what, five years to the appellate jurisdictions, so there's no judgments that are final, because the U.S. is not participating. Our next question is... Is um, the Chinese aircraft manufacturer Comac and their C919 an example of how they've just taken the technology and they walk away and we have no recourse, either Europe or America? Yes and no. Um, you know, the Chinese have been developing a lot of their own technology. And they've been basing it on what they see in the West, what they see other people doing. There was, though, a court case. I think the Chinese have been convicted of stealing Boeing technology. Am I, am I making that up? And, and also, um, I'm remembering that, which could mean I'm making it up, but it <laughs> sounds true. And Chevrolet. Um, and Chevrolet and a few other things like that. So yes, there is some stolen technology involved, but 
as, as you may know, the manufacturing of airplanes is not simply a matter of getting the designs and machining some parts. Uh, it's a pretty sophisticated process that we're very good at. Um, but, you know, China has been working on this for a while. And they're not, you know, Embraer, you know, Brazilians make airplanes. Uh, a lot of people make airplanes now. So we're staying ahead of them, and that's pretty much what America has to keep doing, staying ahead of the competition. Um, I once went, this goes back 10 years now, I went to a guy at the Chinese Ministry of Finance and said, we, the OECD, want to start talking to you about the, the government-sponsored finance for airplanes because there are international agreements on how much subsidy you can provide and the rates you have to charge and stuff like that because between us and Airbus, Airbus is really competitive. And the guy said to me, we don't make airplanes. And I said, yeah, but you're trying to. And someday you're gonna. And well, welcome to someday. And you know, we've got to deal with all those things, but we've got to outcompete them is what we've got to do. Um, you know, many, many countries require some kind of technology transfer arrangement in order to allow a big American company to come in and produce products. So it's, it's not unusual for some transfer of technology to take place. The, the Chinese have taken it to a certain, a higher art form. Um, and that combined with commercial espionage, where there are cases of that, um, it has made China, China particularly egregious um, partner in this case. But, it, but it's some of that technology transfer happens in the course of a General Motors deciding that they want to produce vehicles someplace. They know that that technology is going to get into other hands and that purse, that company, the local company, will eventually become a competitor. So part of the game is to just keep one step ahead and, um, and be five years, ten years better. I want to say one more thing, because listening to her always makes me think of stuff. Uh, this is a prime example of where the United States ought to be out there getting international rules on what to do about products that incorporate stolen technology, right? And if a company or manufacturer said, hold it, you know, that's my, that's my engine, we ought to have international rules that prevent that engine from being sold anywhere in the world. And that's where U.S. leadership and some of these international rulemaking bodies could really help us. Uh, I, <clears throat> I have a two-part question. <clears throat> First of all, I've been in business management for more than 20 years just like you and, and uh, been concerned uh, with the drift, but uh, it appears that Blinken and Jake Sullivan have been effective. I wanted So the first part of my question is, uh, how do you evaluate their performance? But the second question is, uh, more, more important maybe for the future of America, and that is, <clears throat> who in the Democratic Party do you think would be able to bring the gravitas and the business kind of experience to um, their candidacy if they were to run for president in, 2020, in 2024 um, <clears throat> to help uh, bridge the gap? Yikes. Um. <laughs> To answer the second part first, I mean, my personal favorite is someone who's probably not even in the running, and that is our current Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, who uh, was formerly governor of the state of Rhode Island. Um, she is, yeah, <laughs> Claire's home state. <laughs> she, she's, she's a rock star in this cabinet, and uh, was in uh, uh, Capital Markets, She's run businesses. She gets it. And uh, she's smart and I would say less political than many of the other cabinet appointees um, and really knows how to get things done. I think she'd be great. I, don't, I doubt that she's even in the mix um, to run. She might be a VP candidate. Who knows? But I think, honestly, there's... There's a lot of business acumen lacking in both parties, uh, and that worries me a lot. Uh, and many of the moderates in both parties have been driven out or left or out of disgust, anger, just they're damn tired of the, all the fighting. Um, and so we're left with um, 
some folks who are on the fringes of the party in, in both the House and the Senate, and that makes things tough. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the first part of your question. It's just Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken. I think they're doing a pretty good job. Um, it took Tony Blinken a while to get his feet on the ground, I would say. But, um, you know, they're out and about, and they're, they're meeting face-to-face. -face. I mean, the, the pandemic was a part of all of this mix that made it much harder to do business, um, do government business. But I think um, somebody asked me not too long ago to give a, a grade to this, the Biden administration, and I think it was like B minus, C plus. Um, th there's a lot that they could be doing to help business, large and small, um, that they're not uh, directly, although I would say some of the legislation that's been passed most recently, um, the big, big three spending bills may help a lot and certainly are putting money into investing in strengthening America's uh, technical future and innovation um, capabilities. And, and I think that's, that's as much uh, a part of how America leads going forward and wins as um, in some of our geopolitical relationships. Um, I, I, the most important thing that this administration has done is to invest in America and improve our technology, our standing, our strength, uh, which not only works here at home, but it gives us more standing in the world, gives us more sway, gives us influence, gives us a model that people want to cover, want to, want to copy. Um, I, I would say with, when it comes to Sullivan and Blinken, it's not what they've done, it's what they haven't done. Um, I don't see any real international economic policy from this administration. They don't have a trade policy. They don't know what to do with the Trump tariffs. Instead of taking the Trump tariffs and going to China with our agenda and saying, we'll drop this stuff, we'll let you, you know, we'll lower prices for American consumers if you agree to letting American companies do X, Y, and Z, uh, they've just stayed silent on it. They haven't done a thing. They've just kept the old tariffs on. So you all are paying more for the goods you buy, and we're not using it to get anything for Americans in terms of uh, our access to China and other places. Um, they don't have an international rulemaking agenda. They don't have an international uh, trademark copyright intellectual property agenda. Uh, and the, the agreements like the TPP, the the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we, we negotiated, which is a real 21st century agreement, Trump to bolt us out of it, uh, they won't say peep about whether we should get back in. Meanwhile, China's beating down their door, and these guys are hard, who are in it are trying to keep China out, hoping that we'll come in, but we show no signs of having any kind of agenda to get there, anything we want to get back in, and the one that we were negotiating with Europe is also gone. So there's no international economic agenda. And that, to me, as an economic officer who spent his life working on international economic issues, uh, that's really sad. And I don't know what happened. You covered a lot, and thank you very much. There was a bias towards the United States, but what China did in 40 years was absolutely amazing. And the West contributed, I'm sorry, what they did. We did a Marshall Plan, but it was the West. It was the United States, it was Europe, and what I call uh, the West, the East, the East, the East, the West, the East, the West, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Singapore, and Hong Kong were already democracies. But what I, what do you think? Did, didn't we initially think as one was we had a political approach and we had a business approach. The political approach to me was, on hindsight, is we can turn China into the largest world's democracy, just as we did with Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. The business people said, oh, 1.2 billion people, abject poverty, what a marketplace. In 
40 years. I, I can't remember when you said that financial thing was it 96, 97 over that financial collapse that we had. It was 2009. No, I'm, I'm going back before that. There was one in Asia in the 96 or 97. It was, it was, 90, it was 97. It was the, when the Thai bot hit the. Well, well, one thing that struck me was China at that time yeah. said, we're not doing the West. I mean, they absolutely came out and said, we're not doing this Western thing anymore. I mean, they finally said, and you look at us now, I, I don't agree with you, sir, but I enjoyed your presentation. We cannot go out and say to these people, you have to do this and you have to do that. I'll tell you why. The rest of the world hates the United States for that. What was the question? OK. Do you think? that that's what we did in politics as far as looking to turn it into a democracy and the businessmen looking at it as a, uh, a market for us. But like Henry Ford, China needed their workers to be able to uh, earn some money and spend it in their country. Yeah, it's, no, it's a good question. And I, I think Stating that the U.S. political objective was to turn China into a democracy is an overstatement, I believe. Um, at least the policymakers that I interacted with in, the, um, in all the administrations, the U.S. administrations in the 1990s and 2000s, felt that we were establishing an international order of sorts that would bring China more into the world of economics and uh, fair, fairer economics and trade, uh, and really felt that we were helping to shape them to become more of a, a global, a fair global player in the world following global rules. I don't think there was there were probably some, but I don't think there was a large number of people who really believed that we were going to turn China into a democracy, not anytime soon. Um, and, but don't forget, there was a period in the early 2000s where there, China was even experimenting with um, democracy at the local level in electing local village leaders and such. And that certainly gave people both in the business community and in the government, some you know, hope that maybe that was the direction it was headed in. But I, I don't think there was a big game plan to change China's political system anytime soon. But yes, indeed, the business community, first and foremost, thinks about money. They think about who is their number one stakeholder, and it's their shareholders, uh, and indeed, a market of 1.2, now 1.4 billion people cannot be ignored. And if the U.S. pulls out, and for any reason, shape, or form, you better believe no other major country in the world is going to do the same. And it will just leave opportunity on the table for others and, and will be left out. That's my personal view. Yeah, I... Uh, I I understand the question. It's an important question. I don't think any of us ever thought China would become a democracy. And as Carolyn said, there were Chinese leaders talking about it in the early 2000s, uh, when Jiabao, on his way out the door as prime minister, uh, talked specifically about democracy. And, well, he was out, so that was gone. Uh, but, you know, we all thought it would sort of loosen the strictures of the Communist Party, that it would make lives better for Chinese. And they would have more choice, and that, and, that, and that did work out that way. But let's face it, the process of sort of economic development to democracy around the world, it's not a sure thing. Um, it took Korea 40 years of military dictatorship before they, they finally sprang, the, you know, sprang into the democracy that, that they are today. Uh, Singapore is still you know, halfway there, and will probably stay halfway there for most of our lifetimes. Um, so it's not a sure thing, but I, let me tell you, when we went to China in 1980, you talked to a college student and said, what are you going to do when you graduate? And he or she would say, 
I don't know. I will go anywhere I can serve the state, which meant they're going to assign me somewhere, and I got to go. I got no choice. Uh, 10, 15 years later, you said, what are you going to do when you graduate? And the answer would be, well, they're going to try to assign me somewhere, but I got a cousin working in these economic zones down in Shenzhen, and he thinks he can get me a job, and I'm going to skip out on the assignment and go down there. Right? And then kind of in the early 2000s, 2010, 2015, you say, what are you going to do when you graduate? And they would say, well, I want to go to the U.S. and go to law school and come back and work for an American firm. That was how to achieve success in China in those days. And it worked for a lot of people. Um, nowadays, it's, you know, it's been going backwards. It's a little harder. Um, unfortunately, the money and the effort of the government is going to state enterprises. So a lot of people are going to get swept up in the state enterprise system. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a backwards model. It's state control. It's party, Communist Party control of state enterprises. Communist Party operators and the private enterprises, uh, state control of markets um, so that they don't get too out of hand, state control, obviously, of media and free expression. So it has definitely gone backwards in, in terms of Communist Party control. And I guess I'd say, look, I'm with the Beach Boys on this one. Be true to your school. Uh, we know that doesn't work. And it didn't work in the 80s. And it's not going to work in the 2020s. And so I just feel like eventually those pressures are going to come back. And there is more personal choice in the lives of Chinese. There's not political freedom, but there's personal choice in a way that they haven't enjoyed in the past. And that sometime that will lead to more, uh, I'd say, looser strictures, let's put it that way, not democracy. We, uh, we see now that uh, the Chinese are trying to preempt the U.S. dollar. They're making uh, agreements with Brazil and India and other countries around Saudi Arabia and so on. What is your uh, outlook on that? What do you think that's going to do for us? Good luck. Um, you know, money's worth what you can do with it, right? What can you buy with U.S. dollar? You can buy oil, you can buy gold, you can buy goods anywhere in the world. You can buy an investment in any country in the world. You can invest in the world's largest economy with the biggest market and the strongest currency. So what can you do with a renminbi? Well, you can buy a little bit of oil in, in Dubai. I think they have got a couple markets where you can do it in, in uh, renminbi. You can have barter and, and trade agreements with like Russia. So you can get more oil and some raw materials. Uh, you can't buy what China needs to develop. China needs raw materials and minerals from, and they get a lot of that from Russia through the, the barter agreements, and yeah, you can do that in renminbi. You can trade with Iran and get some oil in renminbi. Uh, but you can't get the technology, the automated manufacturing, the productivity increases that China, with a declining population, needs to increase productivity to maintain economic growth. You can't get that without US dollars or euros. That comes from the United States, Germany, Japan. And so, you know, yeah, sure, use your renminbi. Play poker with it. Buy some oil. But it's not going to be a world currency on the level because you can't buy stuff. You can't buy investments. You can't buy companies. And you can't buy productivity increases, which is what China desperately needs at this stage. And the other elephant in the room would be Taiwan. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Sorry, the, yeah, we got to go to Taiwan. But I just want to say, um, but the U.S. better the heck get our act together on um, extending our debt ceiling and quit messing around with U.S. financial um, the financial situation uh, because it will have a huge. Im if we can't run our country and run our finances in a responsible way, at some point, the dollar is not going to be the king. And other countries are going to turn elsewhere. And I think China, is in part, is reacting to the fact that the US has used the dollar to um, 
from a sanctions perspective, and very effectively so, but they want to get out of the thumb or from under the thumb of uh, the restrictions. So, uh, but you said. You want to do a tag one? No, you do. You can do a tag one. Richard Mueller is going to answer the question about Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is a great place. Um, they're wonderful people. They've achieved enormous amounts in terms of technology and in terms of democracy. I mean, there are not many places in the world where you can have a fist fight on the floor, floor of parliament. But that's how vibrant and active Taiwan's democracy is. They do that from time to time. Um, it's, you know, it's a place that is dear, near and dear to the hearts of many Americans. Um, and it's a place that we all think has a right to exist. The question is, what does it take for Taiwan to continue its prosperity, its democracy? Um, you know, what does it take to maintain its vibrancy and its society and its economic growth? And I think that's, you know, let's not, let's not cause trouble. I mean, does a visit by a Speaker of the House make, China, make Taiwan safer or not? Uh, does a U.S. military exercise militarize the question of Taiwan instead of making it a social and economic question for the people of Taiwan? So I think a lot of these things are not being done in order to improve the prosperity and security of Taiwan. I think they're being done using Taiwan as a backdrop for some American political purpose, and I don't like that. Uh, I do think U.S. relations, U.S. investment, U.S. ties to Taiwan have been really important in maintaining their prosperity and their status, and I think there's a lot we can do to continue that. But forcing the issue is not going to help Taiwan, and it's not going to help the people there lead the kind of lives they, they've been able to lead. Can you explain, Carolyn, can you explain 996? Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. What I understand is in China, nine in the morning to nine at night, six days a week, seventy-two hours a week versus forty hours a week. I mean, those people went at it. Yeah. Okay. It is true. There's a very strong work ethic in China, um, and um, a lot demanded of the workforce, particularly in the factory setting, uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're more productive. Um, I, I would argue with that as well. They put, for a country that's assembling a lot of products, probably working twice as hard does put out more product. But it doesn't necessarily, over time, make them a stronger producer than the United States. I, I think there's a, and what we're also seeing is a backlash, in particularly the younger generation in China. This this laid back um, effort where they're saying, I don't want to work so hard. I want a real life. Um, so I don't think the working work ethic of the last ten years, perhaps is the same one that we're going to be dealing with going forward, just it, it, the same as in the United States. Um, we're, you know, we're all kind of dealing with this post-pandemic impacts of our working world and how it's changed and how it, it's going to look like going forward. Do you want to say something? I, I, I'll, I'll answer that with, there are a lot of people in the West, there's more people in China. And there's even more people in India, right? So let's not think China is an isolated part of the world. Um, but, you know, productivity, economic output, is people times machines. And we went through this transition in the 20s, in 20s to 40s, where our people were able to operate machines better than anybody else in the world. And the productivity of American aircraft industries and all the industries that sort of took over the world in the 50s was not based on population. It was based on our productivity with machines. Now, 
to run more sophisticated modern machines, you need a better educated workforce. So what I worry about now is the quality of American education. We're still, by and large, ahead of the Chinese in terms of the education of our workforce, but they have been catching up very fast. Um, and some of the products we make now start with chips. People can't make them. I mean, this is not like take your little screwdriver and make a chip. This is program the machine, design the machine, operate the lithography that makes a chip. And it takes an educated workforce, it takes a sophisticated technology, and it takes a different kind of work environment. The Chinese are trying. They're about three or four or five generations behind the Western companies. Uh, we've imposed export controls on the exported machinery that would let them catch up. They are going to catch up. So we better be another three or four generations ahead when they catch up to where we are now. And so, you know, let's think about productivity. That's our strength. But we got to work a lot harder on an educated workforce and developing the new technologies that are going to keep us ahead. Well, and I just, I don't think the U.S. is ahead in science, science and math. Um, and we have a severe shortage in some areas, including engineers um, and, uh, and um, folks in technology. Immigration is going to help that to some extent in the United States if we keep our doors open. But uh, that's a question for the future. We're not necessarily, we're not there today. Uh, we're certainly not uh, letting in the, the talent um, that we need, and we're not changing the rules to allow foreign students who study here to stay. Uh, it, it's, I think, a, a, it's building to a crisis point. Asked, to what extent is China catching up with the United States as a global economic leader, and what threat do they pose to us? Um, yes. They are catching up to the United States. I would say more as a global economic power than a global economic leader. They got money to throw around. They've got investment. They've got purchases of raw materials. Uh, they are very, very active in international organizations. They've got people at the World Trade Organization. They've got people in all the international bodies, the International Telecommunications Union that nobody cares about, but which sets internet standards and things like that. Um, they have flooded the zone with people in a lot of these organizations, and they're a strong presence. Uh, they don't always have the best ideas or the most persuasive case. Same when they go to countries. Uh, but they show up with cash when they go to countries, and a lot of countries' money talks, particularly some of our third world friends who are not adverse to taking a little money on the side. Um, you know, one of the things we started to do when China announced this huge Belt and Road, which was supposed to be a trillion dollars and a whole lot less. I mean, let's not get too excited. Let's not read Communist Party propaganda and start believing the world is about to end. But, you know, when China started the Belt and Road, they were going around shopping projects all over the world. And the U.S. government quietly, I'd say too quietly, put together a couple teams of State Department and Treasury Department types who would go to these countries and say, okay, Chinese have offered you a, a deal at 3% to build a dam here, there, and everywhere. You'll get this much electricity out of it. Let's go down and see what your options are. Well, the Asian Development Bank, which we put a lot of money in, the IMF has money. All these other places have money. All these engineering firms can build you a more productive dam at about the same cost, or maybe a higher cost, but over time, your payments are the same. We started showing them what their options were. And countries that were kind of sitting there with this Chinese offer, hey, you want a dam? Uh, were suddenly in a position where, at the very least, they could negotiate with China, because the US was helping them see what their other options were. And there's a lot of stuff we can do like that uh, that makes the Chinese play and compete in the world. The Chinese Belt and Road projects were, <coughs> these were mostly like Chinese companies that had built tons of infrastructure in China and had prospered doing that. And suddenly, the, you know, they had enough bridges to nowhere in China. 
and they wanted to go overseas, so the Chinese Development Bank started saying, you find customers, we'll finance you. So you had a Chinese company proposing a Chinese project in a foreign country and saying, we'll finance it, and your grandchildren can pay the bill in 30 years. You know, and to a lot of countries, particularly where there were side payments involved, that seemed like a pretty good deal. Uh, but once they started to look at the alternatives with U.S. help, some of them decided, no, it wasn't that good a deal. Or at the very least, they could get a better deal from the Chinese than they were being offered. So I, th I think there's a lot we can do, even without ponying up, you know, a couple, what, what do we pledge, $110 billion. I don't know if we've delivered on that. But even without ponying up the money, there's a lot we can do to help countries get the best deal for their own development. Thank you. I think that will conclude our program for this evening. Please help me in thanking our guests. What a wonderful presentation.